Welcome back to Harbaugh. As the Occupy Wall Street protests continue into the fourth week now, the crowds are continuing to grow around the country. As protesters express their anger at the bleak economic situation many Americans are facing. Now there comes a report that adds some validity to that anger. According to the New York Times, average household incomes fell more after the recession than during the economic crisis itself. During the period between June 2009 and June of this year, household incomes fell 6.7 percent to just under $50,000 compared to a 3.2 percent fall from December of 2007 to June 2009, when average household incomes were over $53,000. So many politicians have begun to weigh in on the protests falling along partisan lines. So who will ultimately end up benefiting from the Occupy Wall Street movement? Our question right now. Ron Christie's a Republican strategist and Steve Karnacki's a writer with Salon. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. I guess I have to ask you, first of all, what is your emotional reaction when you see those people in the streets, particularly downtown New York in the Wall Street area, Ron Christie? What's your personal reaction to seeing these pictures of people down there? Well, it's pretty moving to see a large number of folks uh, protesting in the streets, Chris. I guess my first uh, emotional response is, I feel your pain. I understand where you're coming from, but go get a job. Go get a job. So you think they're there by their own, their own problem. They just blew it. I think when you find a lot of people who are coming uh, to New York City, college students uh, who are out having sex in the lawn, people who admit that they're there just to be part of a good time, people who are taking drugs, people who are breaking the law, yeah, I think they need to go get a job. I think that there are people who are legitimately in New York and in cities across the United States who don't have a job, who don't have a prospect of hope, but I think there are a number of people who are going there to be disruptive, and I think that's wrong. Well, you just hit all the erogenous zones of right-wing outrage there. I didn't know all that was going well, on. I'm, Let me go to I, Steve I, Karnacki. You've just filled yeah. me in. Steve, is all that true? that descriptive uh, account of what's going on, uh, outdoor sex, drugs, whatever, <laughs> well, I, people, I, people out on the, on the land, people should be looking for a job that could easily have one. Is that picture accurate from your perspective? I'll, I'll tell you something. I live a few blocks away from there, and, and if that's true, maybe I'm spending my Saturday nights in the wrong place because uh, <laughs> that's, that's, new, that's <laughs> news to me. Um, well, it, what, give me your description of all the points in that crowd. Well, well I mean, I think, listen, I think, it's, it, I think it's a diverse crowd. I think I think. What it started as a few weeks ago is probably different than what it's become since then, because it's grown. I think I, I think if you looked at sort of the hardcore, you know, component of this thing at, at the start, it was extremely decentralized. I think it was very disconnected from you know from politics, from having a political agenda, and I think it really just expressed frustration more than anything else. I think what's happened is people looked at that frustration. You look at you know, for instance, the New York Times story you're talking about right now, where you know the, the duration of unemployment, now the average duration of unemployment employment for somebody, you know, Ron is saying, go get a job. Well, this is as high as it's been since the Great Depression. We're talking about an average of 40 weeks now, at least, that people are out of work. You know, and that's just the people who are still looking for work. I mean, how many people have given up in this economy? So I think people from coming from that perspective yeah. looked at these protests and they saw something that resonated with them. And I think so that's what it's coming to express. Down, it's hard to be, it's like Kennedy talking about the guys back from Vietnam. Ron and, and Steve, you both went down and saw the same crowds with these, you have different reactions. You first, Ron. You smelled the crowd. You saw yes. them. You know what you're talking about visually, right? Yes, I do. Uh, and it's, it's just a disgrace. I think people okay. have the obligation, if they're upset with the government, they have a lawful petition right to say, hey, this isn't right. But they don't have a right to urinate on the lawn. They don't yeah, have a right to push police officers over. They're not mad at the government. They're mad at Wall over. Street. They're not mad at Wall Street. Well, they're, they're, they they're, they're, they're like they're the, uh, the business people. Well, their anger is misplaced. If they actually really want to be angry at somebody, I would suggest their elected officials in Washington, D.C., who can't get it done. I'd be angry at this administration. Okay, let's take a look frankly, at our who received a lot of money from Wall Street. Yeah. That resonates with what our candidate, the leader of the House, said. Here he is, a Republican leader of the House, last Friday, not too long ago, two days ago, talking about the protesters. I, for one, am increasingly concerned about the growing mobs occupying Wall Street and the other cities across the country. And believe it or not, some in this town have actually condoned the pitting of Americans against Americans. Well, here's who he's talking about, Nancy Pelosi, the Democratic leader, hitting back and defending the protesters just yesterday. Let's listen. I didn't hear him say anything when the Tea Party was out demonstrating, actually spitting on members of Congress right here in the Capitol. And he and his colleagues were putting signs in the windows, encouraging them. 
Steve, there you have the difference. I guess a mob looks like a mob if you're looking at it from the right. If you're looking at it from the left, if you will, or center left, it looks like your people. Uh, but it is true. Why were the Tea Partiers not called a mob? Well, I, I remember that, that, that there was, you know, some talk. You remember those town hall meetings in the summer of 2009? A lot of them got really unruly, got, you know, got out of, uh, got out of control. You know, I, I think there's a, there's a certain truth to the idea that when there's a movement that's clearly identified with one side of the political spectrum, the other side will try to emphasize sort of the most extreme elements of it in order to rile up its own base, you know, in, in response. But, I mean, I, I think what, what's interesting when you talk about comparisons between the Tea Party and what you're seeing on Wall Street right now, I, I think the connection between – what was going on and what is going on with the Tea Party in partisan politics was very clear. You look at the average Tea Party member, they voted for John McCain in 2008, like 95 percent of them did. Fundamentally, yeah. when you strip it all else, everything else away, the Tea Party movement was really just and is just an anti-Obama movement. I, I think it's fair to say that the values that are sort of shaping the Wall Street movement are probably more on the left than the right, at least as we now define the political spectrum. But I don't think at this point, at least, we can connect it as easily to partisan politics. We have Nancy Pelosi. We have other Democrats saying very constructive, positive things about it right now. But of course, a lot of the Democrats who are doing that you know, have been some, been some of Wall Street's best friends through the years. So I, 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 it's yet to be seen if you can connect the, the movement on Wall Street to politics quite the way the Tea Party movement has been. You know, you know Ron, you know, there's a really historic uh, uh, precedent for this. I mean, going back to the beginning of our republic, people from the West have mistrusted the big New York bankers. I mean, as Andy Jackson stuff. This isn't un-American, is it? What do you think? It, how do you put it in our history? The stuff in New York right now. I don't now. think it's un-American. I, I think, uh, if, uh, frankly, our history, this looks a lot to me like 1968. A lot of people coming yeah. out against the Vietnam War, a lot of people protesting. The difference here, though, when you look at Eric Cantor's use of the word mob, Chris, I looked it up on Webster's before I came on tonight. A mob, according to Webster's, is a large and disorderly crowd. What yeah. you have in New York City is a large group. Some of these folks have been disorderly. By definition, that's a mob. You didn't see the same sort of activity with the Tea Party. And this allegation that Nancy Pelosi just had this has me so angry. I was at that Tea Party rally when she said that members of Congress were spat upon. I was standing right there. I saw these members yeah. of Congress who are in the members of the Black Congressional Black Caucus. I didn't see a thing. So if she's got some proof, I'd like to see it. But yeah. denigrating the Tea Party, who've been largely peaceful in their demonstrations, yeah. has is nowhere near analogous to what we're seeing in New okay. York. Okay, uh, you may be right, but you're wrong about the '60s. I loved them. They were fabulous, and I loved a good part. <laughs> I didn't like the assassinations, obviously, but the other part of the yes. '68 experience was incredible. Anyway, thank you, Ron Christie. Thank you, Steve Kornacki, for joining us in this great debate, which is growing.